Point of View is brought to you in association with Stambic Bank, moving forward. And Glowfet Company Limited, growing growth. This is the point of view. Welcome. And tonight we have a great show for you. My name is Bernard Avila. It's an interactive program on City TV. And we come to you with a lot of exciting conversations. We bring the right guests. We ask the relevant questions. And you always go home with some useful insights. Our hashtag is the point of view. And of course, we're on Facebook at City TV GH. So today we're taking you back to a year and a week ago. On the 3rd of June, 2018, from around 9 p.m., from Aoshi, a family tried to save the life of their 70 year old father, Anthony Opokwe Champong. They drove him in a Mercedes Benz from the family house in Aoshi to the CNJ hospital. After pleading with nurses, they did not get a chance to treat their father. He was later moved to the Accra Regional Hospital, known as Ridge Hospital. They went to the police hospital the Kolibu Hospital, the Kolibu Polyclinic. They ended up at the Lekma Hospital, having gone through the Snit Hospital. None of the seven hospitals was able to administer treatment for this man. Well, he died at the Lekma Hospital. It led to a national outcry. Tonight, it's a year since that man's demise. We revisit that very controversial issue and ask, has the no-bed syndrome ceased? We have a very exciting way of approaching this topic. When we come back, I'll tell you how. Stay with us. So we have an extended show for you today. It's one and a half hours on TV and also on Facebook. So you can stay with us till very late in the program. I have the Deputy Minister for Health in studio. He is also a member of Parliament. He's called Alexander Kor Aban. He will try and address some of the policy questions around managing public health care in the country, specifically the issue of emergency services. I also have the longtime president of the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association, Dr. Asante Krobia, an old friend of ours. Doc, great to have you. Thank you. Right. And of course, honorable, good to see you. Good to see you. It's been a long time. It's been a long time. And so recently when I met you in a, a program, <laughs> I had not set eyes on you yes. ever, ever since I left Legon. I was doing Galamsey and you caught me. <laughs> but that was for a different day. We also have a 40-minute interview I recorded a few hours before this show with the Director General of the Ghana Health Service. I'll play a few minutes of that interview now. And later on, I'll play that interview before the show. And so we have a lot happening on the program. Now, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to start with a quick report that uh, Caleb Kuda put together, reminding us of June 3, 2018, and the over two hours tortuous journey of Mr. Opokwe Champong. My dad, who wasn't, you know, best stricken by any ill health, had to just die like that because the doctors and the nurses who were on duties at the various hospitals we took him to all actually didn't do what could have saved my father, but rather they helped him to die. Ishmael Obri, son of a 70-year-old, recounted to me what was a painful journey to save their father's life only to be turned away by seven major hospitals in a car. My dad, who wasn't, you know, best stricken by any ill health, had to just die like that because the doctors and the nurses who were on duties at the various hospitals we took him to all actually didn't do what could have saved my father, but rather they helped him to die. Not only did the fuel in their car run out, the breath of Esther Opukwe Champon's husband ran out too. Ironically, this was in his own car at the hospital. This was after an hour and 48 minutes of a journey across 49.35 kilometers. 
you know, if, you know, anything could get worse, at least first aid could have saved him. Only for us to go to the hospital, starting from CNJ Medical Hospital, Medicare Hospital, for the nurse on duty and a doctor uh, to tell us that there's nothing they can do. I don't know if it was with the age I mentioned, because my dad is 70 years. And so when I was asked of his age and I said he was 70 years, and then the next answer was, there's nothing we can do. So take him to Kolibu Teaching Hospital. At this moment, it becomes more than sad because that was where our hopes were because this is a hospital we've been from my infancy. That is where I've received all my treatment, all my other siblings, both women abroad, my mom, the entire family. And the worst of it is that, you know, this is a place where my dad actually supplies stationery. Since my dad is actually into publishing, you know. So from CMJ Medicare Hospital, we were asked to take him to Kolibu CME. When we got there, we were told there was, there's no bed for my dad to be um, admitted on and treated. And so we should take him to um, Kolibu Polyclinic. We go to Kolibu Polyclinic and we're told there's no bed. Not even first aid. I mean, all the, all the names of the hospitals I'm mentioning. Not even a single person came to administer even the paracetamol. So we had to take him from the Kolibu the Polyclinic to um, Ridge Hospital. When we got to Ridge Hospital, we were told there's no bed. And so we should take him to police hospital. We got to the police hospital, there was no bed. So we should take him to the trust hospital. We got to the trust hospital, there was no bed. So we should take him to La Polyclinic. That was when somebody suggested we should take him to rather um, Lekman Hospital. Because they probably would have all the facilities because they are a bigger hospital and it's new, much new compared to the ones that we went to and so on. So with all hopes, we drove there only to be told there's no bed. And even the Lekman Hospital was even worse because upon several pleading after our car had run out of fuel, not even a nurse or the doctor on duty agreed to even bring a stretcher out for my dad to be put on to be treated. Madame Esther believes if any of the doctors had offered some assistance, her husband would not have died. Now we are my papa. We are doctor, Papa. Doctor, we share the same money. I'm going to be paying money. I'm frowning. I'm going to do. Mommy, pay me to send me. I'm going to do what we need. I'm sorry. I'm paying what you mean to me, Nancy. I'm paying what you mean to me, Nancy. Me too. We need a me yum, me yum, 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 yum. We need a man car. We need a man say. I said that's something I'm so. I said that's something I'm so. Why? Why don't you have a bill? What's the bill? She appealed to health authorities to work to put a stop to the phenomenon. Medicare. <laughs> Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Anthony Insia Asari, at the time promised that his outfit will work to make the incident the last. I'm so sad. I'm very much disturbed about the situation. I think it shouldn't have happened. We are going to use it to solve a bigger problem. A year on, Family sources tell City News it is yet to receive the full details of a report investigating the matter. However, City News has cited excerpts of the report, which reveal that some of the facilities had beds at the time Mr. Opukwe Champong was turned away. A year on, has the issue of no bed syndrome in hospitals been permanently solved? You be the judge. So that was Caleb Kudesh's report, and indeed, we have excerpts of that report. For example, in the executive summary, in relation to the CNJ hospital, it says, there were empty hospital beds at the time of the incident 
in the facilities, although the emergency units were full, an indication of inefficient bed management. In the Great Accra Regional Hospital in Lekma, the emergency units were full, but there were beds available in other wards. In cases of C and J, all their hospital beds were empty, including those at the emergency unit. I want to show you the root of the victim because it, it tells a story. He went to seven hospitals in a space of about three hours. Look at that. He left Awoshi and he drove 16 kilometers to CNJ Hospital, where we are told there were 20 empty beds. There was a doctor on duty, yet they said there was no bed for reasons best known to them. He drove another 16 minutes, or the, the family, the son Ishmael, drove him in an old Mercedes Benz to Kolebu Hospital. Similar story. They moved to Kolebu Polyclinic, which was just a minute away. No help. Then they went to the Great Takara Regional Hospital, which is Ridge Hospital. They didn't even allow them to enter. They were told there was no bed. That was another 6.5 kilometers. Now, they then drove to the um, police hospital, a seven-minute drive, still no bed. They went to the Trust Hospital in Osu, still no bed. Now, when they got to Lekma, and I'm going to read an excerpt from the report. When they got to the entrance of the hospital, the security man directed them to the emergency unit. Their fuel got finished upon reaching the entrance of the emergency unit. Ishmael's cousin, Kobe, was following them in a taxi. When he returned, when he entered the emergency unit, there was no nurse at the waiting area of the unit. They, that's Ishmael, the son, and Kobe, who was following in a taxi, asked one of the patients if they could talk to any nurse. The director asked to knock on the first door on the left. He knocked on the door and the lady came out and told her they had brought in an emergency case. She said there was no bed. They pleaded for help for his father. In response, the lady said there was nothing she could do and then closed the door. His cousin, Kobe, was angry, so he banged on the door again. And when she came out, she indicated that she had already told them there was no bed. And she entered and closed the door a second time. They saw a gentleman, described by the report as staff, passing, and they followed him. And then he, Ishmael, the son, called him and informed him they had brought an emergency case. The gentleman said there was nothing he could do and directed them to see the nurse at the emergency unit. He came back to the emergency unit where the patients were, and one of the patients said one doctor in court was lying in a car in the compound. He went outside and saw the doctor in court lying in a car park straight ahead of the exit of the emergency unit. He knocked at the front glass and asked if he was the doctor, which responded in the affirmative. He then informed him that his father was in critical condition. The doctor, quote unquote, came out of his car, moved to their car, peeped inside and said, your father is in a critical condition, but there is nothing I can do since there is no bed. All right. Before I talk to my two guests here, I, I interviewed Dr. Antonin Siasar, who is the director of the Ghana Health Service, exactly a year ago today, on the 10th of June. I called him on the phone, and this was the report he gave to Caleb. So today I went back to his office and I said, okay, a year ago you said to me that this report, and I quoted it to him, this report should um, lead us to do good things, and this should never happen in Ghana. So after 365 days, what have you done? So let's listen to what he told me a few hours ago in his office. So it's been a year since we spoke to the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Anthony Siansari, on CTFM at the time about the sad incident involving the 70-year-old Anthony Opokwe Champon. He died after seven hospitals refused him treatment on the basis of no bed. Today, we want to find out from the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, Dr. Anthony Siansari, what series of actions he put in place after that incident. And a year since that interview, what has changed with our health service within the jurisdiction of the Ghana Health Service? Doc, thank you for talking to us. Thank you. So it's not a really good anniversary, but this is exactly a year since I spoke to you. And you said to me that you had put in place a committee to investigate what happened and you were going to put in place certain reforms to ensure that this never happens again. 
So since June 2018, walk us through some of the things you put in place to deal with this no bed syndrome. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, as you rightly said, I mean, this is not something that you should have maybe celebrating or remember today. But it happened. But something happened for something good to happen from it. Remember that when we spoke about a year ago, we in Ghana Health Service quickly put in uh, a committee to look at what actually went wrong, especially at the Ghana Health Service side. Because the story was that uh, a patient went to about two of our facilities and eventually died in one of them. And the Parliamentary Select Committee and Parliament, the Honorable Speaker of Parliament, also requested that we should investigate and then quickly tell them what happened. I know that the Honorable Minister of Health also put in a bigger committee, which we fed in whatever we had also to do. But we also sent a, a report separately to Parliamentary Select Committee. But if you remember very well, what we did immediately this happened was that I issued a statement to all facilities that under no circumstance should anybody be turned away mm -hmm. because there's no bed. And my argument was that in times of emergency, we do also emergency um, things to avert whatever is supposed to happen. So emergencies call for emergency uh, actions. So it doesn't matter if you even don't have a bed. You should be able to save the patient's life and resuscitate the patient anywhere that you can get within the facility before you move the patient to the next step. You see, the work we do in health sector is uh, through referrals. We have what we call the gate power mechanism. So when somebody comes to you, the first point of call, you are supposed to resuscitate the patient and move the patient forward. If you don't, if you don't have the means, you don't have the facilities, you don't have the personnel, or you don't have the specialty to treat the patient. And that's exactly what we did. Secondly, when we went around and saw what actually happened, Kolebu Teaching Hospital and Ghana Health Service Regional Directory, especially within the metropolis. You see, no bed syndrome doesn't happen in the districts. Because the districts, either you like it or not, you are the only facility there, so you see the patients. Because if you go to any district, there's only one district hospital. Mm -hmm. Or must maybe one or two other hospitals also attached to it. So when the patient comes to you, you dare not say that you cannot see the patient. What happens is mainly in the metropolis, namely Accra and Kumasi metropolis. So we also said that we have to work together with the teaching hospitals so that the teaching hospitals will then know if they cannot even take the patient on, that they know where they are best. We also work together with ambulance service. Unfortunately, the ambulance service is now being revamped and we are bringing in about 275 ambulances so that there will be ambulances at hotspots in every constituency. I'll call it hotspots. So that no ambulance will be, uh, ambulance will be available within the shortest possible time and move the patient from one, one area to another area. Mm -hmm. So this is what we have done so far. The committee which the minister formed was a, a very broad-based committee involving the regulatory bodies, medical dental council, nurse and midwifery council, pharmacy council, food and drugs authority, and all the service, ag service agencies, namely Kolebu, Konfuanoche, and then a CHAG, and even the private practitioners, so that we work together. You see, in health, according to our ethics, if mm. any, pati any patient comes to you as an emergency, either you like it or not, you have to see. In fact, if I'm a doctor and I'm moving on the road and there's an accident, and anybody gets to know that I'm a doctor, and then I refuse to give the patient first aid, I can be sent to medical and dental council. Wow. So you are enjoined? You are enjoined to see any patient in terms of emergency, irrespective of sex, um, religion, race, or anything. And that's what we normally do. And if you cannot manage the patient at where you are, then you move the patient to the next stage. So can we say preliminarily that on the basis of what the report found, the issue was not a lack of bed, but failure to adhere to protocols. The issue was, to me, not lack of bed. Because the first place the patient went to, that's a private facility. There was no patient in that facility. CNG? Yes, there was no patient in that facility. And they had about, I think, 20 beds. So you cannot talk about lack of beds. There were 20 beds at CNG? 
I think there were 20 beds, according to the report. Other 20 or... Uh, there, was there was more no, than 10 There was beds. no patient in. And we knew that there was no patient in. So the problem is not, to me, so far as I'm concerned, in this particular case, it was not lack of beds. Was there a doctor? It's, I, we, yes, from the report, we knew there was a doctor there. So it, ideally, the patient should have been detained there, resuscitated, any means that you can do according to the, what the facility has before you move the patient to the next stage. And so far as some of us are concerned, that is what's supposed to happen. If you move the patient straight away to Kolebu, and Kolebu accident, you know Kolebu, Accra doesn't have an accident center like we have in Kumasi. Kumasi has a built accident emergency center. So when somebody comes to accident emergency center, it's supposed to be seen. Because if you have a patient, that's the essence of accident emergency center. If you have a patient brought in, that patient is a priority. And in, ideally, in accident emergency center, people don't lie down there for weeks. So there's no reason there's to no say reason that the place why. is full. Yes. So even if the place is full of patients who don't need maybe emergency situation. You see, patients, they are like brothers and sisters. If a patient is even lying down there and he went through the same situation and he was sick, he was brought and he was worked on, and they bring somebody like in what she or she had in that situation, and say, oh, please, can you sit on the chair and let us resuscitate this patient? Every patient will agree. Mm. Two of the facilities in question are your facilities. The Great Accra Regional Hospital, known yes. as Ridge Hospital, yes. and Lekma Hospital. Yes. What did the, re, the committee find about the conduct of your people in these hospitals? In Great Accra Regional Hospital, Ridge, apparently the patient never entered the facility. Somebody, from the report that we had, somebody apparently said there is no bed. When they got to the entrance? Entrance. So that's where the problem is. So in our, uh, my release, I sent around that the only person who can declare there's no bed in the hospital is the hospital facility in charge or somebody that he has relegated the position to maybe he is off duty or is not there to do it. Not somebody who is standing at the gate mm. or somebody who is just passing by. Mm. So that's where the problem is. And then when the patient was also sent later on to Lekma Hospital, the same thing actually happened. In Lekma Hospital, by the time the patient reached Lekma Hospital, it will be, it's only God we can see the patient. That was the last was the of last the seven. Point of, yes. But then we are told that then, two people... Yes. Two people, somebody was in a car or something, and then he came to... When he was... That's the story. Begged, he came to see the patient. And that time, the patient was already gone. So what happened between the hours? I'm not, I'm not too sure if... You see, even if a patient comes and the patient is dying, sometimes you have to do something. If you like my hospital also, that's what I was telling them, they also mix it. Because if I was a doctor or in charge there, you make sure that even if there's, you just bring a trolley and put the patient on and rush the patient for resuscitation until you declare the patient dead. That's what happened. When the patient, and they didn't even do the minimum. Yeah, when the patient but, is... But doc, your people were not even accepting people. Are you not concerned as director of Ghana Health that your health professionals see an uh, invalid in, in or somebody who's sick? Their first response is to say, we, don't, we can't touch you. We can't, we can't talk to you. Should, should, it should, is, should that not be a concern that the people who are supposed to be health professionals are this unconcerned about patients? That was one of my problems, and that's one of the service problems. And that's the reason why we issued that document. That's the reason why we've now taken people through emergency preparedness, emergency medicine, how to treat emergencies. In Ghana, most of the cases that we see in most of the hospitals are emergency cases. Because all our hospitals are acute hospitals. So ideally, the first priority is emergency cases. We don't have hospitals where we keep patients for uh, convalescent hospital where we keep rehab centers. You know. So when somebody comes to you, either you like it or not, you just see the patient. You can take the vital signs. And we are now, because of this, we have also intensified the training that we are giving to our, our staff. It's regular, continuous quality improvement train them and train them. Some people may uh, relax and, and lack all these things, but we, have to, we are now doing that. In fact, I'm sure after this time, 
you will not go to Lekma and somebody will tell you that there's no bed. So, as they were, the story said, then you, you bang the door. This is still the point of view. That was the first part of my interview with uh, Dr. Anthony Siansari. In studio is Honorable Ko Alex Aban, who is the Deputy Minister for Health, and Dr. Kweku Asante Krobia, who is the President of the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association. Now, so we ended by saying, he says, you wouldn't go to a hospital and be told there's no bed. Send us your comments and your experiences. You go to hospitals regularly. Let us know. Doc, let me start with you. I mean, as the leader of nurses in Ghana, listening to portions of the report and the conduct of some of your members a year ago, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you owe Ghanaians an apology in some, in some shape or form, do you not? That is rightly so. And the right way to describe the situation is uh, preposterous. I do not think that uh, we uh, have any excuse. You know, in these uh, scenes of uh, incidents that happened uh, one year ago, and uh, we have rendered apologies where it is due. So um, we have also resolved to make amends in the way we discharge our duties. And so I do not think that from this time, as the Director General rightly said, uh, we're going to see any, any such thing happening, especially when it is about um, making sure at all costs mm. that we give attention to patients needing care who come to the health facility there is going to be a change. But to the extent that this happened in different kinds of hospitals, CNJ is private, Kolebu is a full teaching hospital, Lekma and Ridge are Ghana Health Service hospitals. To think that the net, and most of the people they met were nurses, to think that all of them said the same thing, it means this is not a facility-specific issue. This is a, a human issue. Lack of care, mm. lack of concern. How did we get here? Why would, why would nurses in seven hospitals say to a 70-year-old patient, we don't have a bed, even though in some cases there were beds? Right. We have tried to assign various reasons to why this thing occurred. But the bottom line is that uh, we didn't do well. And uh, part of the problem, as uh, we judged, after we have also gone through the reports that uh, the Ghana Research Nurses and Midwives Association um, received from the, the um, team I put up to do the investigation revealed, uh, part of it is lack of, lack of confidence on the part of the people they met to be able to master the courage to face the situation. And uh, th that is what... Uh, lack of see. courage. I mean, um, it, is a, it, it was about emergency, right? And um, you cannot just uh, um, come out without the required confidence to face a situation like this. And normally, the spontaneous uh, response to such an action will be that... Uh, once the patient was uh, on, the, on his way to that hospital, has come to that facility for care, and you think that without the, the, the required, or the, 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 the needed confidence, you will not be able to handle the situation. The best way to, but is if to find you, an if excuse to say that. But if you can't handle a 70-year-old man in that condition, how will you handle somebody who has had a car crash? Who is bleeding? So is it that your people are not properly well, trained, they, or they are, they are two different things? In fact, in, in situations of uh, uh, trauma like this, when a patient has had a victim has had a, a car crash and an accident of this nature, it, it still depends on um, how you see the patient, assessment that you put the patients through for you to be able to make the judgment. If it is about resuscitation, you have to be a person who possesses the skill to be able to handle or manage the situation. If a patient is uh, brought to a hospital having sustained uh, uh, injuries from a car accident and it is about, let's say, uh, if it's about bleeding case, it's different from when a patient is gasping for breath. Mm. And so 
it is the judgment you make and assessing yourself whether you'll be able to yeah. handle the situation. If you cannot, honestly, the best thing to do is to say that uh, the patient must go to uh, the next stage of the... Um, well, I, I don't know life. if I get you, but let me come to the Deputy Minister for now. I'll let you breathe a bit. So you are both a member of Parliament and the Deputy Minister. This report was to be submitted to Parliament and was indeed submitted to Parliament. So you, you are coming to this from two levels. As a member of the legislature, which has some level of oversight, and then now you are the Deputy Minister for Health. It's been a year since this happened. Outline for us what government has done to claim that this is no longer going to happen. Thank you. Good evening to you. Good evening to our cherished viewers. First thing, small correction. My name is Alexander Kujukom. Not Ko. Not Ko. I see. Kom uh, as in hunger. Kujukom. I see. Aban. Thank you for the correction. Okay. Having done so, let me um, join Doctor in rendering unqualified apologies to the family of um, the, the deceased. Uh, I believe that now that it's a, a year, uh, we may be uh, bruising their wounds. Mm. But be that as it may, it is for the greater good of the country that we discuss the matter. Um, let me first state that I do not have so much competence as far as the technicalities of medicine is concerned um, to uh, talk about some of the things, but at least I know that you are asking about uh, the uh, things that have been done or things that have been put in place as a matter of policy by government and all that. But uh, Bernard, be before we go into that, I tried to educate myself a little, right, uh, as to some of these things, why they happen. Uh, you have already given examples uh, like CNJ, where indeed evidence points to the fact that there were beds. 20 beds. Okay. Ha, but All of them were empty. Good. But they found a very nice excuse by saying that there's no bed. There's no bed. He, I think, uh, made mention of uh, maybe the confidence that somebody may have to uh, master to be able to say that, no, I can handle it. No, I cannot handle it. And instead of going ahead to say that, maybe I do not have the competence, he rather says there's no bet. And so that becomes the reason, even though the real reason may be, may, may, may be somewhere. But they didn't because, allow the doctor to see the person, no, to because, know if they can handle it or not. Because, so we didn't even get there. Because in, 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 in uh, my very uh, hazy reading of uh, uh, portions of the, the report, uh, it turns out that at CNJ, the uh, doctor there was a psychiatric doctor. On okay. duty? Yes. So most probably, most probably, he did not have the competence to deal with a situation like that. Most probably. All right. In my little uh, education, uh, I mean, uh, trying to understand some of these things prior to coming here, uh, I was actually told, okay, or I have learned that when you go to the hospital, uh, there's what is called triage, okay? It's uh, a process of sorting out uh, according to the degree or the severity of uh, the, situ the situation, okay? where they use colors like red to uh, determine that it's very, very critical. Orange, yellow, and green in that descending order, right? Where green would mean that uh, the person's situation is stable a little and all that. So it is this range of things, okay? And the various facilities that are required, okay, apart from just the physical bed, it's what may lead to somebody to say that there is no better. So we as lay people, right, may go there and find out that there's a bed. A bed as, as we know, a bed. But if, for instance, uh, the triage is done 
and that you require X, Y, Z in addition to the physical bed. And those things are not there. They can tell you there's no bed. But because we see that there is bed, we think that they are just lying to us. Because they may not, yes. Because this, <laughs> let, let, me, let, let me, no. You see, I want to explain to you what I have learned. Okay? That you go, and I'm sure he is a professional. So he may even speak better to it. But I think that there is also time for us to uh, get this understanding out there. That's what I'm saying. That, that there may be a bed. Yes. But we lay so, people assume we, that if we, there's a bed, it means somebody can be treated. But exactly. professionals, a bed can be there, but the person cannot be treated. Because maybe once they have done the triage and they see that the person is red, uh, 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 probably he needs oxygen, probably he needs this, probably he needs that, probably he needs that, in addition to the physical bed. And so if they even put you on the physical bed, and these things are absent, there's all virtually but, nothing yeah, but that they can if do. If you haven't okay. engaged the patient to examine them, Unless I, I don't mind understand you, triaging. Mind you. Do you do triaging by scanning the person's eye and say, oh, this is the, the person? Because you, in all the cases, they didn't even test the person's pulse. No, mind you. They just said, I, uh, I don't, oh, I, there's I no bed, go away. I don't think so. so I so, think, I no, think that's from the report. The I report think that from It was only the Lachlan Hospital that a certain doctor, quote unquote, tested the man's pulse and said, the guy is gone. Probably, probably you are reading from a different report. Uh, from what I, I, I've read, I see. Because the point here is this: so what when, is your they went, when they went to Kalebu Main Surgical and Medical Emergency, okay, he was. I'm just. I'm just reading what I have uh, 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 summarized. Mm. He was examined in his car, and realized that his condition was not good. There was no bed for him. They tried. They tried him, red, but did not have the bed. They then referred him to Kolebu Polyclinic. But so the, but when the report, he went to... But the, report, went to the report Kolebu, I read said there were beds at Kolebu. But when he went to Kolebu Polyclinic, Polyclinic yes. he had the triage sheet with the sun. The sun yes. went with it. But my point is, why, why, that, but why was good. he tested in his... Why was he checked in his car when there were beds? Is it a normal protocol, you and Is it a normal mm -hmm. protocol to examine people in their cars when there is bed available? Because the report said there were beds. So why do you go and do whatever you are doing in the car? It depends on the situation. The point or the area where you have to place the patient and do assessment doesn't really matter. It so depends, that's the assessment. It depends, yes. It depends on the situation you meet. Because if, you, if a patient is driven in and is bleeding in a car, why shouldn't I make sure that I stop the bleeding before I move the patient But this person wasn't of, bleeding. No, no. I'm just giving you an example. That's why I said where you put the patient and uh, begin to administer treatment doesn't really matter. The most important thing is that you've taken the patient out of trouble, having managed the situation such that you have been able to stabilize the patient before other things happen. For example, if you are normally, uh, nurses are at the um, receiving point of uh, these uh, clients who come to the hospital. So if a nurse meets the patient and eventually patients come to the hospital with the aim of seeing the doctor, but you just cannot move a patient and then um, whisk him to the consulting room for him to see the doctor because the nurse will definitely have to do something. And if it is an emergency situation where I believe where the very first place I meet the patient is the, is the place that I have to give the most critical attention to the patient. I must do so before I move the patient. To this well, side. I'll take a short break when, because the part of the report is saying that the hospitals didn't even adhere to strict A and E protocols. But I'll come back to this. My guests are Dr. Santi Krobia, Ghana Richard Nurse Association, and Alexander Kom Abban. He is the Deputy Minister for Health. We also have more from the Ghana Health Service Director when we come back. Stay with us. So why are you taking me back to what?
It's about the use of electronic equipment and how we dispose them. We look for the copper, the price, all of, all of everything, we look for it. But the rubber and the, and the rubbish, they, we throw it away. Those in the business say this is how they earn a living. The kilo in one pound is a uh, 5 But do they consider the environmental and health hazard? Ghana, a dumping site for electronic waste. You can see that huge ball is indeed a very scary thing. Today, Agboboloji is a mountain of hazards. What is happening here is that copper wire has been extracted from cables that have been brought here at the Agboboloji dump site. Coming up this June, counting the cost, the electronic dump site in Agboboloji, a CTTV documentary. We spice up your mornings with culturally enriched conversations, social interviews, and policy-oriented discussions that will keep you updated on the progress of the nation. Let your voice be heard with the hashtag Breakfast Daily. It's actually a good thing and healthy to be okay in your own skin. Mm. Not because you don't have the options, but it's also healthy to be able to say, listen, I'm going to the movies by myself. I'm going to the restaurant by myself. Join us for breakfast daily, only on City TV. Join the Breakfast Daily team Monday through Fridays from 7.30 a.m. to 10. Come back we're still trying to understand whether anything has changed and in fact if you are watching and you have a sh an experience to share with us on the hospital issues let us know now while all this is going on something happened this weekend and i'll probably share with you during the show where the former minister for energy uh, uh, kofi Bua, mm -hmm. is complaining that as of 6th june an assemblyman in his constituency had to die because of the no bed syndrome and if, if I, I think if uh, Anas, you can put it on the screen for me just read quickly. So it says, needless death of Honorable Roxon, assemblyman for Ekokonu, who was involved in a motor accident. He was stabilized at Ekwe Catholic Hospital in Elembele. Doctors at the hospital strongly recommended he be moved to Kolebu or a hospital in Kumasi or Cape Coast with facilities to deal with head injury. Mm -hmm. Kolebu accident and emergency line was called several times with no answer. Cape Coast Teaching Hospital advised us to transfer to Kolebu because oxygen was not available for the patient. Mm -hmm. For four hours, it was about working the phones and finding out a big man to help secure a bed to save a life. Guess what? We finally got a doctor to help in Konfuanochi um, Teaching Hospital. But this was four hours too late. Uh, well, Honorable Roxin died at Cape Coast Hospital before he could reach Kumasi. There's a second part of this message that I want to read. It says, But the chilling words of Dr. Cooper of Equay Hospital is what is eating me up. When I asked Dr. Cooper how often he deals with solutions like situations like this, this was his answer. We deal with no bed, no oxygen every day. And people who must live just die needlessly. Unquote. These are the heart-wrenching issues that must engage all of us as leaders and Ghanaians. Of course, I could ask him what he did as, when he was in power, but that's not why I'm here. This was Sith. June. June, three days ago, oh. you've issued, it's been a year since this 70-year-old man died. Parliament said they were working to address no bed syndrome. Report was to be ready by July 6, 2018. A year since this happened, we are still told there's no bed syndrome. So I don't know what you're telling me, Honorable Minister. Oh, thank you very much. I think if uh, you read uh, the, his story very well, I think it goes to even strengthen the point I made earlier. You realize that uh, he said the doctor was complaining about no bed, right? About no oxygen, mm -hmm. about other things. Going to uh, strengthen the point I made that it's not just about the physical bed, but it's about, about all allied facilities that, ma that go with the bed, right? Uh, so it's not just uh, the, 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 the simple bit. But the thing is that I think uh, the problem is myriad. We have to look at infrastructure matter. 
we have to look at, apart from physical infrastructure, we have to look at even uh, equipment, other supplies, and of course, the human factor. Right? And these things, um, I would say, for instance, if we are looking at it in terms of uh, ambulance service, I know that uh, the, the government started this ambulance service, but it has, it has not been as effective as it must be. Our, I have an announcement for you. Since 2018, Good. June, the one, digital, one ambulance promise has still not been fulfilled. Good. So at the time this incident occurred, there were 55 functioning host ambulances, public. The number has reduced. So nothing has happened in a year. So we are not even, So I wanted you to tell me, so what have you done as a government based on the report? I'm seeing some recommendations. Adhere to strict A&E referral policy, monitor and ensure strict compliance. But I don't, have, I don't have anything to show me that if something happens to me today, somebody will not tell me there's no bed. Um, I think that uh, when it comes to uh, the ambulances, I, ad I admit that uh, it has taken too long. But I know that soon and very soon, the 217, uh, 275 uh, uh, ambulances... Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king. Yes, the 275 ambulances. Let me read some recommendations in the report for doctor's comments. It said the hospital should ensure strict adherence to A&E and referral policies and guidelines. Two, monitor and ensure strict compliance with the directive from the DG of GHS on the no bed syndrome, namely that only a senior medical officer can declare no bed. Three, reorganize the emergency unit and introduce a reception because in many cases, there was no reception. They had to knock on some door. Four, relook at its roster and increase the number of triad nurses, improve their bed managing systems. So it's actually human issues. Sure. So we actually yes. blame no bed when the bed were there. Exactly. We admit that. A designated senior officer, head of nursing or head of clinical service, should be made responsible for managing beds in the hospital. Sure. There should be coordination between the emergency wards and the normal wards so that patients can be moved from the emergency ward to normal ward to create more beds to accommodate patients in the emergency ward. Medical doctors on emergency duty should include at least one senior doctor or medical officer. And then it goes on and on and on. So I, I, this is what has been put in place. I just want to know, you are in charge of nurses in Ghana. Is this thing, is this system working now as we speak? No, I would say no, because uh, we haven't got there yet. Because uh, we haven't got there yet. Yes, because you need the um, caliber of personnel mentioned here to be available before you can lay the structure, right? You need the uh, technical expertise of the people who are mentioned here before you can lay the structure. And I'm saying that you haven't got there yet. You see, uh, making sure that we deliver quality care to the clients that come to the hospital in, in consideration, the numbers matter. The, 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 the staffing norms, what we call the staffing norm, the skill mix and the availability of the uh, personnel that we can use to deliver and place them at certain strategic positions to be able to manage the care also matters. If you haven't got that, uh, there's no way we are going to ensure that. But these recommendations are good, perfect. But I am saying that it's going to take some time for us to be able to put that in place to ensure that uh, um, we have met the goals. Let me read That's some comments for you. Bernard, why can't we match our infrastructure with our population growth? I mean, we are growing at 2.5%, yet we are depending on the same infrastructure. Kojo Boache from Asimfosu. Bernard, I had the same experience this year at 37 Military Hospital. It took a call from my cousin uh, at around 1.45 a.m. to the unit before we were given bed. Bernard, that's the anthem in our health centers. This is Christian Jacobson. Bernard, it's a pity. It's very sad indeed, but I blame the politicians. Everything has been politicized. What we need to do is to pray. Our health system is collapsing. The talk is too much with no action. Sometimes we forget we are dealing with human lives. No one cares. This one is Golu from Wuad. Bernard, good evening. Most of these nurses are always found fidgeting with their phones at the expense of patients' life, which should be their core mandate. But to be frank, those at the rural areas are really working hard. Good evening, Avale. Listening to excerpts from the report, it indicates the health practitioners in Ghana are not concerned about our health. 
What were the recommendations from the committee set by the Ghana Health Service? And what was the punishment meted to health practitioners found culpable for not resuscitating him? Poor working attitude and lack of passion for the work they all rushed to do. It's now about the esteem attached to being a doctor and a nurse, but not the passion to save lives anymore. Reginald Kwamina, our three years in junior. What is your brief on punishment? Because in some of the cases, like C and J, there were two, there were nurses, there were beds, there was a doctor, nothing happened. Same for Lekman. Do you know if anybody had been sanctioned either for ethical or professional breaches? I think uh, for what I read, they were required to be dealt with by their respective uh, regulatory bodies. For instance, uh, those who were uh, medical officers were supposed to be dealt with by mm. uh, medical and dental council, those who were nurses, nurses and midwifery council. But as at now, I do not have any evidence that anybody has been punished for uh, their negligence or uh, anything le leading to the death of the man. I cannot, I cannot uh, speak to that. What, what, what about ben, you? Ben, you? You would know. Bernard, let me put this in. You um, would know. The Nelson Amigifi Council is in the process of doing so. Um, it's in the process, process of doing a so. year after this happened. Well, um, the Ghana Health Service moved the report to the attention of the Nelson Amigifi Council. And I happen to be a member of the board of the council mm. and also a member of the subcommittee, the disciplinary subcommittee. Mm. We are handling it. And that's why I'm saying we are in the process of doing so because we received a report from uh, Ghana Health Service at a point in time that we constituted the, the, the board uh, met and looked at it and, and uh, requested the subcommittee, which is the subcommittee, to manage. You see, um, there have been a number of settings to um, receive reports and the reactions of those who are indicted. And two of them, basically, are on the line to um, possibly face disciplinary action. The committee has finished its work. It's not yet in the public domain, so I can't put it out here. But definitely something is going to be done. The report that the, the Ghana Reset Nurses and Mid uh, Midwives Association also moved to the um, National Military Council, inducted three. But that of the Ghana has been inducted two. We have met... So, so five in all? No. Or they are the same? Yeah, they are the same people, except that uh, this, the two people that Ghana Health Service indicted, the report indicted, um, are the same two people that uh, uh, the Ghana Research Nurses but, Association but, reports. But look, somebody has died from clearly what is not an infrastructure problem, but a human problem. The report was supposed to have been ready July 6th. That's 11 months ago. You are now right. telling me that you are in the process of yes. so you are clearly so it means that even no. the media didn't bring this issue no. up you probably just brush down the couple of them go and sleep you are, somewhere you are, get, you, you are getting me wrong what i'm saying is that um it's a process well i uh, i feel very sad to think about to recall this incident that happened uh one year ago and when the committee met in fact uh, we invited the grief-stricken um widow and uh, Ishmael, that is the son of the disease. And uh, it, it was difficult to hold your uh, emotions when uh, we requested the widow to even uh, give a report of what happened. But uh, thankfully, the report of the Ghana Health Service corroborated with the report of the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association one. And so that's what I'm saying. But you, in all these things, you also agree with me that those who are inducted deserve fair hearing, right? And that is why we have initiated the process to mm. listen to them before the appropriate... Let me read a few more comments for you. Eben Carbon Hartog, in September 2018, my aunt passed away, having been turned away by staff of Kolebu, saying there was no bed. After engaging the staff for about 10 minutes, they refused to attend to my aunt in the ambulance. So we drove off to another facility. Kolebu... Then came out and said we were impatient. We did not wait long enough. For an emergency, 10 minutes wasn't long enough. Sally Armstrong, Bernard, my own wife, friend's wife was turned down by no best genome at Kaneshi, Kolebu, and finally died after labor at Ridge Hospital just last month. And the funeral is pending. Our health facilities have failed us woefully. The last in Mabel, 
I'm very, very disappointed. Look, Bernard, nothing has been done. They should tell us that and stop deepening our woes. The health sector cannot perform at its best with lay people leading it. Ismail Ayine Akaribo. Poverty is not a good thing because with just a phone call, a bed and a doctor will appear. Sorry to the bereaved family and may he rest in peace while we continue to struggle for a better healthcare system. Kwesi Poku says no bed syndrome is about money. They look at the person and they think he or she is poor. That's it. Well, clearly, yeah, no, no, clearly was, you haven't I, solved I was, the problem. I was on a point. You know. um, it is said that the wheels of justice grind slowly. But it's also and, said that justice delayed is justice denied. Yes, but you know the, the um, legal systems in our country. I can even say that what I told you in the process of doing is uh, um, far better than what we see, cases that we hear uh, getting tried in the law courts of this country. And I can tell you that this So one, your process is better? Your yeah, process is better All because right. I'm telling you, it was only at a point in time when Ghana has a Musa report to mm. the council. And right after that, we considered this committee, got the disciplinary committee into action, and look at the okay. case. And because the people who are elected also deserve fair hearing, mm. we had to even allow them to bring their legal uh, counsel to follow them I see. to the hearing. Let me, give, so let me give the last word for this segment to you. What is your assurance to Ghanaians? Thank you very much. Um, I know that uh, there have been delays in making sure that uh, the problems that we face um, have been resolved. But uh, I can also say that there are a lot of human uh, errors, uh, not necessarily that we don't even have the competence. So I think that beyond provision of um, infrastructure and the necessary facilities, the need for greater reorientation of the medical profession i mean professionals within the medical sector is very very critical and i think uh, from now we should take a step in doing that because i'm going to tell you a story somebody just called me this morning right that uh, he went to uh, Sridhar government hospital and uh, that was yesterday around 4:45 the nurse just told them that the doctor says uh, it is time he's, he's leaving, right? This one, for instance, would not be a matter of facility. It would not be a matter of equipment. It is just a matter of the doctor saying that he is just leaving, right? So it's a mixture of all these things. And I think that when government does its part, probably, of pro providing the facilities and all that, those who are practitioners in the field must also do their part, which is in accord with their mm. calling. Okay. When, when we come back, we're going to take you further into the interview with the director of the Ghana Health Service because we did ask him a couple of questions about the priorities of the health service in the way they were dealing with this issue and procuring drones when we needed other issues. So we'll be right back. This is the point of view. Stay with us. Conversations that help you shape your spiritual journey as a Christian. Find the answers you seek. Catch the 700 Club with Pat Robinson every Sunday morning at 8:30 a.m. on City TV. Has anybody again. been sanctioned because of the seven, you are saying two are your facilities, so you're directly responsible. Has anybody, because even at Ridge, even if the person was not a doctor who said there's no bed, you are responsible for the frontage of your hospital. Yes. So if somebody rushes a patient to you and somebody who looks like an official says there's no bed, so go away, 
the hospital must take responsibility. So that has, the fact that we don't know who told them, because you are responsible for receiving patients. Yes. You see, as I said, the report is of, of uh, Parliament. In fact, the Parliamentary Select Committee is studying it, and I'm sure we shall be called to Parliament also to explain further and then see the way forward. But immediately, you know, in the health sector, when there's a problem, there are two types of sanction. We have our disciplinary code, which is very administrative, and we have the ethical code, which is professional. So after we did our investigations, there are some people who have been sent to their regulatory bodies for them to also investigate and apply the appropriate sanctions. That one has been done. The portions of the report I have seen, we are told the nurses at Lekma Hospital, one of them did not even want to cooperate with the committee. This is the part of the report I have seen, unless you deny this. And the person initially was not cooperating, was very rude to the committee, until later on they, they cooperated. And even then, the, 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 the person's conduct was quite reprehensible yes. from so, what you've read. So such a person, we, we know what to deal, deal with the person. You see, initially, if somebody comes to, to do investigations, some people think, oh, we will not cooperate. But they all cooperated. I'm sure if you read to the end of the report, maybe you have seen that you are holding, they cooperated. And as I said, there are some people who have been sent to the regulatory bodies to investigate for sanction. When I interviewed you on 10th June last year, you said this will be done very soon. If I can quote you, you said, we will use this unfortunate incident to clean up the system. So this never happens again. Yes. And I asked you how soon. You said very soon. We did it. Quickly. It's been a year. We did it quickly. No, but, but, no, but the problem is that you see, uh, we, we no, uh, permit me to say that uh, the, what we were asking for was not whether a committee will work or not. Yes. We we're asking for a committee to work, uh -huh. get to the bottom of the matter. Yes. Sanction those who offended. Yes. And implement new policies. Yes. We've done all. You haven't. We have. I'm sure you were expecting that you come out of, say, these are the people who have been sanctioned. We haven't done, we haven't come out of that. Because after we've done all these things, the people go through another process, through their regulatory bodies. For example, if you go to Medicare and Ethical Council, if you are, you, are, you, are, you are given to the disciplinary committee, it's like a, a high court. No, but if Parliament is still studying a report, you can't. You couldn't have implemented the full report if Parliament is still studying it. No, we are. Imp we started implementing the report. Parliament is looking at it, but there are aspects of the report. For example, training. For example, the collaboration that we are doing with the Kolebu Teaching Hospital and the, all the other facilities, the private and everybody in this uh, metropolis. We are doing that. In fact, even on the, I think on the sixth of June last week, we were supposed to have another meeting with Kolebu. HCUO, myself, the regional director, and everybody. We are now building a system where we will have a system that there will be no time that you, if you want to move a patient, for example, from any hospital to Kolebu as an emergency center, and they don't have beds, there should be a system where it will tell you that, oh, this case can be seen, for example, at Dodoa. Because what happened if they knew that maybe there's bed in Dodoa? Instead of coming to Kolebu and going around like this, they would have gone to Dodoa, they would have reached Dodoa. Or there's a bed in Lekma. Why, so why, all these things have been Why done. hasn't the report been released to the public? It's because it's your premise for this, mm -hmm. and indeed your executive family said, the incident evoked emotions and attracted outcry from family, civil society, and the general public. Yes. You are doing this to build confidence. You yes. are a public-facing institution. Yes. A year since this incident happened, Nobody has been told anything. You say you have a report, and you say Parliament is working on it. Is that not disrespectful to the Ghanaian? No. And you see, it's one thing that maybe you have done a report, and then you are not implementing anything in the report because you have shared it. Or there's one thing that you have seen something, and you are also covering up. That's not what you are doing. We've discussed the report of our council. Our council has given us a go-ahead that do this one, two, three, start training people. In fact, as I speak now, we also realize that people didn't even understand what our disciplinary code is. So we've printed disciplinary code, we've put it on our website, we've put it on the net, and people are now know what sanctions that will be taken against you if you do this. We continuously be issuing statements and releases to people, uh, hospitals. Once a while you get, as, as we said, every house there's a men sign in it. Once a while you get a, a castle trans uh, officer. Well, we deal with them accordingly, according to our display codes. But you obviously don't see the media and the public as partners, because if you are delivering health service, 
in a country where a lot of the population is not fully educated, you've commissioned a report and you say you are implementing behavioral change. Do you not suppose that the public needs to know, for example, certain codes of behavior that derive from this pro uh, process that we can also cooperate with? We haven't been told anything. Yeah. 365 days since yeah. this incident occurred. Uh, you see, maybe what I will say is that maybe we should be uh, collaborating with the media quite often and a lot more than what you are doing. But what you do at every institution, if you go every morning to any institution, we give health education, we tell them the do's and don'ts, what they are, what they are supposed to do. We have our hospital charter, or patient charter all over the place. We now even insist that everybody in the hospital wears a name tag. So that we know that this is a question who did this to me. We, think we get a lot of reports, and any report that we get, which is an adverse report, we act on it quickly. Um, I don't think you expect that we get anything at any hospital, then I ra we rush to the press and tell the press. No, we no. are saying that the no best syndrome has not been solved. Even though you are saying it has. And I'm going to read something to you. Honorable Kofibua, who is the member of parliament for Elembele, on 6th mm -hmm. June, posted this on his Facebook page. And he's a former minister. Mm -hmm. He says, permit me to read. Needless death of Honorable Roxon, assemblyman for Ekokono Elembele, who was involved in a motor accident. He was tabulated at Ekwe Catholic Hospital in Elembele. Doctors at Ekwe Hospital strongly recommended he be moved to Kolebu or Kumasi or Cape Coast with the facilities to deal with internal bleeding, a hospital in those places. Kolebu informed the Ekwe Hospital they had no bed. Cape Coast said they had no oxygen. For four hours, it was about working the phones and finding out a big man to help secure a bed to save his life. Guess what? We finally got a doctor to help in Kung Fu Anochi Teaching Hospital. But this was four long hours later. Well, Honorable Roxin died at Cape Coast Hospital before he could reach Kumasi. But the chilling words of Dr. Cooper of Equay Hospital is what is eating me up. When I asked Dr. Cooper how often he deals with situations like this, this was his answer. We deal with no bed, no oxygen every day. And people who must live just die needlessly, unquote. Let me repeat. We deal with no bed, no oxygen every day. And people who must live just die needlessly. These are the heart-wrenching issues that must engage all of us as leaders and Ghanaians. Signed, Office of the MP, Ellen Bele. Yes, uh, I've read this thing somewhere. But I have some few questions and queries about this. In the first place, the doctor who was talking, I wanted to know, is he the medical officer in charge or the medical superintendent of the hospital? If he is, oxygen, we buy oxygen, we procure oxygen either in cylinders or we have an oxygen plant where it passes through the gas. So if he's running a hospital and oxygen finishes, you have to replenish the oxygen. The no bed is talking about... How do we know if he has money to, to replenish it? Oh, Don't forget, he said there was no oxygen at Cape Coast. Dr. Cooper is in a quay. I can I can hold brief for Cape Coast. Cape Coast is a teaching hospital. Don't have oxygen. Cape Coast is a teaching hospital. So it's not under your jurisdiction. No. Uh, so I don't know why Cape Coast say they don't have oxygen in Cape Coast. But you should be and concerned two, because concerned. it's a network. Isn't yes, it? I'm concerned. And two, Cape Coast is a teaching hospital. Cape Coast is supposed to have oxygen. So that's the question that maybe we have to ask, and I will inquire from Cape Coast. I don't know the day that it happened. And two. He was talking, he was saying that, uh, that they want to send a patient to other Accra, Cape Coast yes. or Kumasi because of internal bleeding. Yes. The question I asked myself, I'm a surgeon. Yeah. So I know if he's talking about internal bleeding, is it in the abdomen or is the skull? If it's the abdomen, every, if it is a surgeon there or any experienced doctor, they should be able to open up and secure whatever bleeding it is. Well, it's a motor accident. We don't have those details. Yes. So, so may, that's why I say that what the honorable member put there should have gone into slight details because if any doctor reads this there will be questions that well he says the Quay hospital said uh -huh. kolibu informed them they had no bed this is the same kolibu yeah, that we have we have just finished it, saying that we have because, it's because i don't know it's, it's because maybe kolibu thinks that the patient should not even move from Equate to kolibu no but they would have said that they said kolibu said we have no bed yeah, but Cape Coast said they have no oxygen yeah he is he is speaking is he is who is writing and i don't think it is who is writing this 
Before you can you go to Kolebe, tell that they, they never heard that. So, so you see, but there I should be a system. Hula, hula balu about no bed. Uh -huh. It would not be something anybody would even repeat. So this is a patient who has an accident. The yes. patient needs to be stabilized very well yes. before the patient moves. Yeah. Equi is nearer to even a fear quanta yes. than Cape Coast. The referring center for Equi is a fear quanta hospital. I'm surprised he didn't talk about a fear quanta hospital. I believe a fear quanta hospital, there are surgeons, I know there are surgeons in a fear quanta hospital who could do maybe a simple operation to secure and resuscitate the patient and put the patient on blood. But we don't know what kind of internal bleeding it was. So if Ekwe is saying that the only three facilities that can deal with this is Cape the Coast, type of Kolebu or Konfanoti, it means you suggest to you that if young Kwanta couldn't do it. So you should have gone into details what it is. No, but th that... But because, you see, the whole point is that yeah. there are referral systems. That's one some of us don't follow the referral system very well. If you want to refer a patient, you deal with the, the facility, you deal with the institution. You don't deal with individual doctors. But well, the doctor may be off duty or he may not be there. So these are some of the things that we have put in place, how the referral system should work in this country. But if the system if was working, why will Kofi Boa and Dr. Cooper be calling doctors in other hospitals if there's a system working? I don't know why he if was it's in a Kuwait hospital and he has internal bleeding. I don't know why he was calling big men for bed. I don't know what it Yeah, because a is part of your Equay Catholic hospital is within it's a, it's a low-level hospital, right? Yes, but, but the problem is that I don't know why he said that they were calling big men to get bed. For what reason, I don't Are you know. saying you don't know that in Ghana you need to call for treatment? For bed. For anything? You don't need it. That's what I've been telling people. You don't need to call me before do you, do you, you get have bed. Ghost, do you send in ghost, um, we call it mystery shopper in, in, in marketing? You do. Where you do. You do once a while. Do you know how difficult it is for ordinary Ghanaians to, to get the attention of health facilities when they have an emergency that you see that's what i'm saying that you see it's because people feel some people feel that i have to get somebody to assist me but why do they feel so that is what because their treatment they get proves that if they don't call nothing will happen that is what but you see it's not in all hospitals that's why you have to also say it there are hospitals where people are trained in emergency medicine if you are if somebody is trained in how to manage emergencies you don't need to call the person before you get a place to sleep or to a place to be treated. I, I, I agree with you. Some people call me here that, oh, I've been to, just after somebody called me, I'm in Konfanochi, I want to see this. Thing. By the time I realized, there's a doctor who was by the patient, treating the patient at the accident emergency. I said, no, Konfanochi accident emergency. I was there before. We said, I set it up. I said, there's emergency physician there, and I don't believe that there's no doctor in that center. The later I said, well, who is the doctor there? The doctor told him, that he's on the patient. He's treating the patient. He doesn't know why he's calling. But people feel that if you call somebody to put in a word, it's a perception. And it's a perception that, as you rightly said, we have to engage the media to make sure that people understand that if you go to any place for treatment, you don't need any big man to go and look for a bed for you. Well, if you need a big man to look for a bed for you, the next place that you have to call is, you know, in our system, we have complaint systems. You can complain to the hospital facility, you can complain to the district, you can complain to the region, or you can complain to the headquarters. Then we'll take action. Because, but if sometimes when you look at it, the people who are saying that have not even mm. complained to anybody, or what they are talking about is the, what they think, oh, if I don't see somebody, mm. my patient will not be looked after very well. well that perception, I beg that we should try to make sure that it doesn't stay. We, the, the issue with systems is not how well it is laid out and the way it is supposed to work. We deal with a system based on how the end user encounters it. Yes. So we will leave that point to the Ghanaian to tell us whether the no bed system is working or not and whether your nicely articulated system is working. Because we can only we we can't check this from an output perspective. We must check it from an outcome perspective. And I can tell you that a lot of Ghanaians will still tell you that the system isn't working as nicely as you put it. Having said that, I want to move forward into other areas. No, let, let me finish. You see, the system is not perfect, as I told you. But I'm sure that if you ask your listeners, most people will tell you it's not as bad a year ago as at now. We are improving. That's why I say it's continuous quality improvement. There's a quality assurance team in place who are also been moving around. 
there is complaints the X where people have can complain and everything. But we are open to suggestions and op uh, from anybody, and we we'll continuously be improving. As Let me end with work. a few points. You've been in this position for at least two years, and you are an emergency physician. At I'm least I'm a, I'm a general surgeon. You're a general surgeon, so you are not just um, a manager. You are somebody who is a doctor. Yes. So you are emotionally connected to the system. Yes. A lot of people think that we've misplaced priorities in the health sector. They talk about the drone facility, $12.4 million. They're saying, for example, that there are more pressing problems with the health sector. More hospitals need beds. We need drugs. As we speak, the number of public ambulances are not up to 60. And this was the case a year ago. If we have $12.5 million to do anything, why should the focus be on drone delivering blood? As they say in Chi, you hear the here and say, hear the fata. I think I've said this over, over and over again. Mm. There is no $12.5 million sitting with Ghana Health Service or Minister of Health or Minister of Finance that we have gone to use to buy drones. Mm. Ghana government, as I speak now, has not put in a peso or a cent in what we are doing at the Omanako and the other centers that we are putting up. Zipline International approach and want to fill in a gap. We are talking about drugs. You can buy all the drugs in Tema or in Accra. You have to distribute them. You can get all the vaccines in the country. You have to distribute them. And you, are, you agree with me that Ghana is not a place where we have helicopters or we have asphalt roads everywhere. There are some areas where it is raining. It's cut off. This is what we are feeling with the private sector. So my priority is that wherever we can leverage on the private sector participation to fill in a gap, we will do it and use the public sector or the government money to do what we are talking about. As I speak now, Government has put in orders for 275 ambulances. They've gone for the first inspection. I'm sure they'll be going for the, uh, another inspection. Then the de uh, post uh, pre delivery inspection will be done. I'm quite sure, but getting to the end of, the, of this month or early July, the ambulances will start coming but to it, the country. Is that not too long in time? Because again, when this issue occurred in June 3 last year, we had a year. And we knew that the ambulance issue, for example, if the man had gone in an ambulance, he probably wouldn't have even needed to go to seven hospitals. Government says they want one dish, one ambulance. Brilliant. Ambulance but does it, one, but it, does it take that long to procure? So again, yeah. when you look at the pool of things you are supposed to do. So you didn't let me finish my point. Okay, so finish. So my point is that Ghana government is not using 12.5 million to go and procure ambul uh, drones. Nobody procure technology nowadays. We buy the services of uh, people we buy technology service, service of technology. Mm. And that is what this agreement is all about. All what we are saying is that at full, uh, uh, full production or full delivery, uh, mm. service performance delivery, we will pay, have paid in the four years 12.5 million, which you pay in small. It's like you want to go for a funeral. You are, you are in law has died. You want to buy cloth. Your child wants to go to school. So you have to you want to use the school fees to go and, and pay for the school fees. I will go and use the school fees to pay for my, my child's school fees. But if somebody said, I could give you the cloth, you pay it over two years. I will take it and pay it 50 CDs or 20 CDs, 20 CDs, and I have a cloth to go for my funeral. That's exactly what you are doing. So these, the drones, if you go down there, there's somebody, remember, it, was, it also came out, that immediately we did it, the first delivery of blood. Also a patient who needed AB positive blood. Where he there to, the only place you can get AB positive blood easily is in Kolebu. At whom? How long will it take? That, that service initially was being given to patients by patient relatives pay. And we are saying that no, patient relatives will not pay. We are not even using government budgetary allocation. I'm sure you tell me that if you go to uh, social responsibility of corporate bodies, is their taxes. Yes. They also pay money to, for us to go for a uh, workup and then blast and all this, mm -hmm. which we don't bring any cap anyway. But Ghanaians are happy about that. So this is what we are doing. So Ghana government is not paying 12.5 million. We don't have the 12.5 million. If you, you are paying me, it later. We are paying it over a period of time. But you are still paying. Through 
social responsibility. It's not government budgetary allocation. So there's no money that you have put in the budget that you are there's going to There's opportunity cost. People say, in terms of your priorities, if I ask you what is the most important five things you need to do, you wouldn't have mentioned drone until they came. So if a service provider comes with a, from the private sector with a solution I will to have push his technology, I will have mentioned, you would definitely have mentioned I will mention, ambulances. I will you mention, need more hospitals. You need more beds. Have, you need more drugs. I will, you wouldn't have mentioned drone have, technology. I will mention that I will leverage on technology to improve the efficiency of the services that we are giving. And that's one of them. We are using uh, artificial intelligence to make sure that we get vaccines, especially. You always talk about, uh, about blood. This drone, which is at Omenaco, which is serving about now, we are moving, we are ramping up slowly. They are also serve, serving, sending anti-vaccines, uh, sorry, vaccines to areas where hitherto it will take a very long time before vaccines reach there. No problem. Your chips compounds, we still have a problem with um, staffing. This, this is something that's, that keeps coming up. There's inadequate mm -hmm. staffing at your chips compounds. Mm -hmm. Which is a major headache for you. The ratio of patient healthcare personnel is, qu is still not very good. Yeah, it's better now. Uh, it's improving. We haven't reached where we want to reach. We are one of the, uh, uh, hitherto, we were one of the worst. But now, as of 2017, we are not. I can tell you that from 2017 to date, we have given financial clearance of over 54,000 health professionals of all categories. We will continuously are getting every, every week or every month, we get financial clearance. So slowly, we are filling all the uh, facilities of uh, personnel. What is left for us is the in, uh, inequities in the personnel um, deployment, which we have now introduced electronic placement system, where we are not sitting and just post people. And because but of that... The doctors that, are not going. Last month, Graphic reported of about X number of doctors who were sent to the three northern regions, less than 20% even accepted. Yeah, it, has been, it has been the case for a long yeah, but time. But you've been in office but for two years. Yeah. What incentives but are you putting I, in place we to are putting, deal with that? You see, we are doing the electronic placement. We are doing what are called the pool factors. Electronic placement? Yeah, How is that going to address that? I'm coming. Pool factors, where we are talking, we've spoken to the regional ministers and this is chief executives. I can give you an example. Give me. At uh, in, uh, where? Uh, in Ashanti region, I think New Adubiasi. The member of parliament is a deputy minister of Agric. Walked to me and said that he needs another doctor to join the doctor who is there. And he has an accommodation, fully furnished, his own accommodation that you give to a doctor to stay in as long as they want to stay in. He went there, the doctor is now in that place. But the ratio in the three regions of the north is very bad. Yes. So we have told the re northern region that, you see, getting accommodation in this thing for doctors, especially everywhere, is not the sole responsibility of us. We cannot do it alone. We are doing it with the district assemblies. We are doing it with the regional uh, coordinating councils. We are doing it with the chiefs and people. Anywhere I go, I tell them, is you use foreigners, you use outsiders to build a village. When I was a small boy in the village attending primary school, every house, everybody wants to, a teacher to come and stay with them in the house. So that in the morning, when the teacher is going to school, the children will run to school early. No child will absent him or herself. When the letter, those when letters come, they read the letters for us and they write letters for us before we were able to write English. So I've been telling Chiefs and people, we went to Oduman today uh, on Friday. I told them that when the people come, don't tell them that this is I have a room for you, but you have to pay two years advance, two hundred Ghana cities a month, four thousand eight hundred. A young nurse who is starting work, why don't you allow her to stay there and every month he gives you money? So these are all some of the things that if you do it, you see doctors move to places where the other colleagues have gone and they, they got all what they need. Every doctor, young doctor needs a place to put the head. He needs a place to work where he'll get the things to work off. You want to get an experience. I've worked in the rural area in the north. I've worked in Tamale before for five and a half years. And that's where I got my best practice there. Because I was doing everything as a surgeon. So Ghana Health Service Council of the Ministry of Health once now to, we are going to, with a private sector uh, involvement, we are, we are going to put accommodation, houses, flats in all hospitals and all regional health directories so that people will get houses to stay in and then we'll solve the problem of people not going to the northern regions. And then we also uh, have put together an incentive package where when you are in the north or you are in a hard to reach area, you should not be paid like somebody who is uh, in a la hospital. Because a hospital, you can go and do locums and all these things. Somebody in one-man station, if he's working 24 hours, seven days in a week, 
why should you receive the same salary as somebody who is in Kolebu where they are about 20 in the team? I believe that people should be paid incentives for work that they've done. And when they say we are hopeful that before the third quarter of this year, we we'll put it together and, and then feed it into our budget. Somebody will say that the facilities should pay. What I say is that it's not every facility who can use its IGF to pay. So this type of incentives should be part of the package which comes from controller. So they are not plenty. They are few. So that we can move people to these areas. And everybody said that if I go there and I can get maybe 400, 500, or 1,000 Ghana cities extra, I will go there. Because if you go to that area, and they say also I've been telling that these chief executives have model schools. Because the young people who are coming, they have children, very small children, kindergarten, primary school. After all, secondary schools are in villages. I went to a school in a very, uh, not a, a town. I went to St. Peter's, the best school in Ghana. <laughs> but I'm, I'm now the director general of Ghana Health Service. So the most important thing for parents are the primary schools, not the secondary schools. So if you get a very good model primary school, every doctor or every nurse plus a husband want to take the child to school and bring the child back home so that he can take care of the child. Not that they leave their wives in Accra and go to other areas because you feel it. Mm. I've done it before and I felt it. And I think this is the way that we are putting together as a service to make sure that we can have equity in the distribution. Final, of my, my final question to you. You've been in this position for over two years. What do you suppose your most important contribution has been? Or at least, of course, the public will judge. But what are you most proud of that you have initiated for which even if you left today, you know that you've sown the seed for something really transformational within the health service. <laughs> Is it, what I think I've done for the past two and a half years that I've come, mm. I've tried to put systems in place. Mm. Because health service uh, system is the most important thing. It doesn't matter in health if you put in millions of dollars and you don't have systems in place, it will fail. Mm. So that is what we have done, that we are doing, that I want to complete as quickly as possible to make sure that the, the, comp uh, the chip system is working very well, the sub-districts are working very well, the, uh, the districts are working well and the regional are working. The region and the districts are not bad because we have district health management teams and regional management health teams. Where we have the missing link is the sub-districts. So as I speak, we are going to do what we call DSHOP. DSHOP is a district health uh, planning system. We are going to train all of them and appoint sub-district heads so that the health centers have heads and they then oversee and then supervise the chief centers. Because the chiefs are the interface between us and the public. And if you lose the supervisory role of those in the sub-district, they will lose everything. So that, is, to me, is one of the things that I'm trying to put in place. Mm. In addition to introducing technology for efficient health services. That's what I'm very proud of. I'm very <laughs> proud of the, the drone of system. The drone system. <laughs> and I'm sure that's what people will remember me for in future. When they realize that the drones are saving lives and saving money for the Ghana government. We'll leave that for posterity to judge. Dr. Anthony Nsiansa is the Director General of the Ghana Health Service, overseeing a vast network of health centers delivering health service to the people. He's been talking to us on the point of view. Stay with us. My name is Ben Adavle. Point of View is brought to you in association with Stambic Bank, Moving Forward, and Glowfert Company Limited, Growing Growth.